Associate Professor James Lim, you have a request. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I wish to participate in this debate. Yeah. Even before you do, I'd just like to point out that it's a last-minute request. And uh, to allow for better scheduling of Parliament sittings, I would encourage all members to continue to give us advance notice uh, if they intend to participate in parliamentary debates. This helps with the timetabling and the scheduling. I seek members' cooperation in this regard. I now call on you to give your speech. You may deliver it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to participate in this debate. I will speak about the steps we can take as a nation toward moving to a better balance in our expenditure on healthcare resources. I will share some details on why I think we can increase the carrying capacity of our healthcare system, perhaps to some detriment in efficiency and some marginal pressure in costs that will pay off, I believe, in terms of greater long-term resilience. As others in this House have shared, and as well understood by this government, our impending public expenditures in, on medical care will be substantially greater than what we have currently allocated for spending today. This is due predominantly to societal ageing and greater health care needs associated with the more elderly population. But my point is more fundamental. It is that even at present, our health care system falls somewhat short of what we might reasonably expect for an economy at our stage of development. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that our current system is fundamentally flawed, nor am I saying that it should be completely overhauled. Indeed, I believe that we can be justifiably proud of the quality of care delivered by our existing system, which blends public as well as private components and has proven remarkably cost efficient in doing so as SPF, SPS Eric Chua has just shared with this House. While I certainly prefer the balance to be tilted more toward a larger public share, a matter on which I had previously spoken about before in the context of the debate on amendments to the Health Services Act in March this year, that is not the focus of my concerns today. Rather, I wish to highlight what I believe is one glaring shortcoming that was raised by the COVID-19 episode because we run our systems so lean, it has become fragile in the face of large, unanticipated, albeit fully predictable shocks, such as the pandemic. Here, a little philosophical discussion may perhaps be in order. The bread and butter function of economists is to maximize the given objective subject to constraints. This generally means that we constantly looking, we are constantly looking for optimal solutions. And we are very happy when we find such solutions. My wife often makes fun of me uh, about how I gain enormous satisfaction by planning my visit to the grocery store along with my other errands, pumping gas, drawing cash, tapao dinner, so that I can make one smooth, continuous trip. In this regard, economists are easily satisfied creatures. But there is another equally tenable worldview, and that is one often held by engineers. Engineers don't look to wholly strip systems of inefficiencies. They recognize that redundancies are important because while under normal conditions, such underutilized elements may seem wasteful, they are mission critical and can prevent the entire failure of the system during times of undue stress. Accordingly, they build bridges that can bear far more weight than one might expect with normal traffic and then add a little more. They design planes that can run with one engine even when the other stops. They design power plants that can possess multiple fault fail safes so that they can keep the whole thing running while a compromised part is being repaired. Sir, so, the number of ICU beds in, our, in Singapore per 100,000 of our population currently stands at 5.7. The average of the OECD and Association of Industrialized Nations is closer to a dozen, twice our number. Of the four economies that have a lower coverage than we do, only one, Japan, has a significantly larger elderly share in its population. More generally, our hospital bed count is also low. We maintain a little more than two beds per thousand of our population, a fraction 
of that of other East Asian economies like Japan and South Korea, which have around a dozen, China, which has around five, and other advanced economies like Denmark, the Netherlands, Israel, and the United States, where the ratio is closer to three. Now, to be clear, this low bed count is not prima facie evidence that there is a problem with the present system. We need to look at the occupancy of said beds, and one could even make the argument that efficient recovery means that we're able to sustain a lower carrying capacity. In a response to a PQ filed last year by my honorable friend, Mr. Leon Pereira, SMS Janil Putuchari, shared that the target bed occupancy rate over the next five years was around 80%, which he added was generally recommended by academic communities as well as healthcare authorities. And in a statement to this House a year prior, he also explained that we have been able to ramp up ICU uh, beds very quickly, as we did during the pandemic. But in that statement, he also acknowledged the need to ramp up ICU bed capacity, although he qualified this by pointing out that this process was non-trivial, being limited principally by the need to increase the medical personnel required to staff such beds. Moreover, Recent data on bed occupancy rates at our major hospitals reveal that this 80% appears to be systematically breached. And over the past month, the rate has routinely exceeded even 90% in Tan Tok Sing, in Ting Fong, and Kutek Puat. And that is under non-pandemic conditions. Taken together, this suggests that the government is both aware and that running our medical infrastructure too lean can come back to bite us during periods of stress, and that we have yet to fully address the problem, even though we are now back in normal times. MOH has shared that it plans to roll out a new health campus in Woodlands, as well as another in Badok. But the remaining projects are expansions of current facilities. Will the minister be willing to share if these are sufficient to cater to not just the anticipated increases in demand due to an aging population, but also relieve some of the existing capacity constraints faced? Or will they be mainly focused on matching resources with new in incoming demand, leaving current capacity largely unaltered? Now, this brings us to what appears to be the key constraint, medical manpower. At present, we also have a comparatively low coverage of doctors and nurses. As of 2021, Singapore has 2.7 physicians per 1,000 people, around two-thirds the OECD average of 3.8. Unsurprisingly, this has led to burnout, stress, and high turnover among our medical professionals, which others in this house have articulated. The solution appears straightforward, and it's uncontentious. We need to increase our supply of medical personnel. The government has stressed the same that ramping up medically trained staff is a priority. The question then is how? There is a global nurse shortage, which the WHO estimates may be close to 6 million, and the International Council of Nurses, to be fair, an interested party, places this at a higher number of around 13 million. Given this context, increasing supply calls for us to attract as well as retain global talent in the short term we're looking for ways to expand domestically trained workers in the longer term. Now, the practical manifestation of our limited beds and doctors is that wait times for admission to a ward has remained elevated at many facilities. This has been most chronic at Kutik Puat, although I've, we've seen spikes at Ng Ting Fong as well as Sing Kang General, the, which is located in the constituency that I represent. On certain days, this could lead to waits even exceeding 24 hours. The question we should ask ourselves is this. Are we willing to accept the status quo, where our patients may occasionally need to wait for more than a day to be admitted to hospital? Perhaps we think that this is a reasonable trade-off to keep overall medical costs down. Or we may use this fact as symptomatic of a need to increase the carrying capacity of the present system. In my earlier speech, I offered some medium-term su suggestions for how we could relieve some of the existing pressure on our system. We could consider increasing the number of recognized universities for basic medical degrees up from the present 100. For experienced doctors who have a long track record of working in other jurisdictions, we can simplify the application 
and accreditation process, perhaps with designated processes based at MOH that would seek out such doctors and encourage them to apply. As we compete for global nursing talent with other advanced economies, many of whom are facing their own nursing shortages, it also makes sense to train more of our homegrown workforce to take this on. We could offer more generous terms for trainees. We could fully waive course fees, for instance, which, to be fair, is already relatively modest, on condition that these trainees also work as nurses in Singapore for a certain duration after graduation. We could also apply uh, to those, this could also apply to those who would consider a mid-career switch. We can ensure that Skills Future funds not only fully cover conversion courses, but also perhaps provide more credit for prior training. For example, early childhood educators and teachers surely would satisfy courses, general courses in communications, critical thinking, data analysis, and behavioral science, all of which are part of the nurse curriculum today. Easing the supply pressure will require that we go beyond policies on the quantity dimension. We could also work on price. At the simplest, this means that salaries in the field should rise. One existing limitation to more sustained increasing, increases in wages is that costs are already high. This, in turn, seems to be led by commercial rental rates for private hospitals, which can spill over into public pricing. The high rent is a function of or you guessed it, elevated land pricing. But it isn't simply about higher wages. If these are simultaneously accompanied by longer hours, if anything, it would be better to increase the total number of doctors and nurses while keeping hours sane. The total wage bill will remain the same, but the quality of care is likely to improve. We could also increase the number of tiers within nursing, the number as is as many as five or six in other countries from our present three of enrolled, registered, and advanced practice nurses. This offers additional upward mobility pathways, making the profession more attractive for those contemplating entry. So, as I explained at the outset, our healthcare system capacity does not appear to be fundamentally flawed, but it is facing pre increasing pressure. And it is wise to adjust and adapt to impending needs at a time of relative calm, rather than the feel the need to kalangkabut to make up for these during a future pandemic scenario.